Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk, we're going to start getting into the replication steps of a virus. And we're going to start at the beginning with attachment and entry. As you know, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. That means they have to get inside of the cell in order to replicate. The problem here, of course, is that they are too big. Virions are too big to just diffuse across the plasma membrane. So there have to be specific mechanisms at play that get the viruses in. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how the viruses find the right cells and then how they get inside to release the nucleic acids. One of the things that we'll see over and over is this property of metastability. Even though we have these very beautiful capsids and envelopes, they're able to come apart at some signal in order to release the genome into the cell. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Um, viruses have to find a cell somehow, and most of this is actually random. Viruses are floating around in the air. They're in various fluids. They have no means of locomotion. They depend on random collisions in order to find the right cell. This is one of the reasons why you know, an infected cell makes so many virus particles, because they have to be able to find a susceptible cell. So the initial encounter of a virus with a cell is just by pure chance. Just the cells are bumping around. They're pushed around by Brownian motion, by diffusion, electro electrostatics. And indeed, they could bind any kind of junk in your respiratory tract that can bind all sorts of things that aren't productive. But this random in interaction is important for them eventually to find the right cell. So doing that has two steps. First, they bump into a cell. They're always bumping into cells, but they don't always stick to them tightly. Uh, there's no specificity to that first step. They can bump into a cell surface, sit there momentarily, then move on to another one until they reach step two, which is to find a, re a specific receptor on the surface. So today we're going to talk about a lot about these receptors. These are molecules on the cell surface that the virus is attached to. So these are very specific. Uh, they can, there can be more than one receptor involved in getting a virus into a cell, as you will see. And sometimes the same receptor can work for different viruses. But there's always a very specific interaction between the virus and the receptor. And then finally, once the receptor is encountered, then the genome can get into the cell. And we'll talk about both of these reactions today, the initial binding and the uh, putting the genome into the cell. Uh, when we do talk about virus receptor interactions, we have to understand the concepts of affinity and avidity, which I'm sure you've all heard about, but we can just review briefly. Affinity is the strength of the interaction between a, a ligand and its receptor. In this case, the ligand is the virus and the receptor is on the cell surface. And it is a sum of all the attractive and repulsive surfaces uh, on the virion and on the receptor. So that's the affinity. So high affinity interactions we draw in this way, even though in some cases there's not really a lock and key analogy going on, but viral proteins and the receptor surfaces have lots of amino acids that interact that form various kinds of non-covalent interaction, you get a high affinity interaction. Low affinity interactions, there's not a good fit between the viral protein and the receptor. There are repulsions going on between the amino acids that cause low affinity. Now avidity, of course, is, is the overall binding, which is a sum of the affinities, but not an arithmetic sum, of course. It's more than the sum of, of the affinities. And this is influenced by the number of binding sites between, say, the virus and the receptor. And so we illustrate that with an antibody binding to its uh, antigen shown here. So of course the antibody is a Y and the antigen's a little blue circle. And we're showing one antigen binding site. This has an affinity of about 10 to the four uh, in terms of the, the equilibrium constant. If you then add a second interaction with the uh, antibody with an antigen, you have 10 to the sixth, yes. Yeah, it's just a higher order sum, right? So the affinity, avidity is a sum of all the affinities, but not a sum. It's more than the, the additive uh, number. 
Uh, so 10 to the 6 when you have 2. And then for some antibodies like IgM that can form these multimeric complexes, the affinity can be, the avidity can be as high as 10 to the 10th. All right, so that's the concept of affinity versus avidity. In general, in virus receptor interactions, affinities are pretty low. But it's, these interactions are multivalent, just like the antibody interactions with antigens are multivalent. Viruses engage multiple receptors on cell surfaces, so the, the avidity is typically quite high. And that's what drives these infections forward, having the high avidity. And we'll see examples of that today. There's never just one viral protein interacting with the receptor, but there's multiple ones. Yeah. So the, so it's a good question. How many, how many receptors do you actually need to get infection? And um, it's a hard answer to get at experimentally. For a few viruses where it's been studied, it's more than one. It's always more than one. And so apparently that's enough. To, so viruses will, the next step after receptor binding is quite different depending on the virus. So sometimes a certain number of receptors you have to engage to get fusion at the cell surface. Other times there is a, an uptake step which really is not dependent on anything other than the virus sticking in a certain place long enough so it can be endocytosed. All right? And then triggering happens later on. And those, those events, it's hard to tell how many receptors you need for that. As you'll see in some of the pictures, the potential for multiple engagement is quite high, but it's not likely that you need all of those all of the time. All right, so the first part today, we'll talk about cellular receptors for viruses. Again, these are proteins or glycoproteins on cell surfaces that bind specific viruses. They're not there for the virus, right? The viruses have evolved to bind to them. They have cellular functions. And, and uh, if you take these receptors away, they have negative, often have negative consequences because we need these proteins. So receptors are essential for all viruses. All the animal viruses we talk about require receptors. Viruses that infect yeasts, they don't have an extracellular phase. They're passed along in, in the genome with the genome of the yeast. So there are no receptors needed for those viruses. They're nucleic acids within the cell. Plant viruses, they, are, they do have extracellular phases, but they get into plants by mechanical damage by insects or by farm equipment breaking leaves and introducing the virus. Uh, there are, we will talk about receptors and co-receptors. This is a bit of a misnomer because the name co signifies a less important role, but in fact these are both, these both molecules are receptors. They're just given that name to distinguish them. Often we call the first molecule discovered a receptor and then the second one X years later a co-receptor, but that isn't really fair because biologically they should probably both be receptors. Now as recently as 1985, only one virus receptor was known, and that is sialic acid for influenza virus. We'll talk about this quite a bit. And this is a sugar, very simple sugar. And uh, then shortly afterwards, a number of technological advancements in uh, the ability to make monoclonal antibodies, recombinant DNA, cloning, transformation, all of a sudden many, many virus receptors were identified. So now basically we have hundreds and hundreds of virus receptors that are known. A few um, generalities about virus receptors. Different viruses can bind the same receptor. For example, adenovirus. You guys remember what an adenovirus looks like, right? It's that Sputnik virus, double-stranded DNA, that uses the same receptor as Coxsackie virus, which is related to polio. It's a picornavirus. And this virus was named after Coxsackie, New York, which if you go up the New York State Thruway, you will see exit 21B is Coxsackie. There was an outbreak of a paralytic illness there in the 1940s, and that led to the isolation of this virus. A, a herpes virus of pigs called pseudorabies virus uh, binds the same receptor as poliovirus. Completely coincidental. These viruses are totally different. 
nothing to do with each other. Just goes to show you there are a finite number of receptors on cell surfaces, so viruses are going to overlap. In addition, viruses of the same family can bind different receptors. So rhinoviruses, which are procornaviruses, there are at least three different receptors for these. Retroviruses, at last count, 16 different receptors. So these are just some of the oddities that to tell you there's not just a simple one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. Here is, are some of the receptors for my favorite family, the picornaviruses. Uh, there are many more known now. This is a, just a summary to give you an idea of the diversity of cell surface molecules that can bind viruses. So here we have a variety of what we call immunoglobulin-like proteins. If you're familiar with the antibody molecule, you know that it's structurally composed of these Ig immunoglobulin-like domains. And we now know that other proteins in the cells have this same structural fold, which is called an, an immunoglobulin fold. You can see a bunch of them here. And these are all receptors for picornaviruses. Now here's the CAR receptor which is the receptor for Coxsackie as well as adenovirus. This is the poliovirus receptor. Uh, this is the, one of the three receptors for rhinoviruses. So you can see these are all Ig-like. In fact, the, the receptors for polio and rhino were all discovered ver very early on in the late 80s. And the receptors all were immunoglobulin-like. So in fact, people thought, well, maybe Ig-like proteins are the only proteins that are virus receptors. But that was soon shown to be wrong because many other kinds of proteins, virtually any kind of surface protein or sugar can be a virus receptor. Here is one called CD55. It doesn't even have a transmembrane domain. It's, it's linked to the membrane by a GPI anchor. Uh, and then there are various other proteins. These are integrins. These are heterodimers that are involved in immune reactions. So a very wide variety of proteins can serve as, as receptors for viruses. Now let's talk a little bit about how a virus would interact with this cell surface receptor. As you might imagine, we have a lot of structural information about viruses and the receptor. So now we can make models and actually solve the structures of the two complexes. So at the upper left is a structure. This is a cryo-EM structure of poliovirus uh, bound to its receptor. So what's done here is you make a soluble form of the receptor. You express it so it no longer is part of the membrane, and you can purify it. You add it to the virus, it will bind to it very specifically, and you can solve the structure, and that's what this is. And so by the icosahedral symmetry rules that we talked about the other day, you would predict that there would be 60 binding sites for a receptor on the surface, and it's in fact what you see in these reconstructions. So this is the poliovirus receptor shown right here, and it is binding... Uh, right around one of the five-fold axis of symmetry, shown right here. So that little star-shaped star promontory, that's a five-fold axis. And you have one, two, three, four, five receptors bound around it. And these receptors fit into a little pocket on the surface of the particle, just in this manner. So here's a five-fold axis of polio, and here's the receptor uh, fitting in. But not all receptors need to fit into a depression like this on the cell surface. An example is... Uh, one of the rhinoviruses. Here's structure of rhino bound to its receptor, uh, a low-density lipoprotein receptor. And this is shown in white. And you can see that the receptors are actually at the top. Uh, there's a little plateau at the five-fold axis. And these are binding to that flat surface. Right, so the, if this were poliovirus, the receptors would be binding outside the five-fold axis. And this just shows that you don't need a depression of any sort. You just need good interactions between the receptor and the virus in order to bind. Yeah? Did you say that um, these were in solution? <clears throat> yes. So these are all in solution. You purify the receptors, free the membrane, and then you simply mix them with virus and they will bind. Is, is it hard to stabilize the protein that has long hydrophobic? Yeah. So if you left the hydrophobic domains on, they would aggregate and make it very difficult. So what you do is you engineer the protein so it lacks the hydrophobic domain. Right. So it's secreted from the cell, free of that. All right, so those are two ways that a receptor could bind to an icosahedral shell. So there's no, there's no obvious protein sticking out of the shell, but this shows that the receptors will find complementary surfaces, or vice versa. So let's, let's look at an enveloped virus and see how that works. Here's influenza virus. Um, 
an envelope virus, you recall, with two different kinds of glycoproteins in the envelope. The envelope, of course, is derived from the host cell. And one of these glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin, or the HA, which we'll talk about a lot in this course, this is the viral protein that interacts with the receptor. Remember, the receptor is sialic acid. So sialic acid is a sugar which is linked to glycoproteins. We'll show you that in a moment. So this is an influenza virion binding to sialic acids uh, on the cell surface. So here is what sialic acid is. That terminal sugar right there is sialic acid. Another name for it is N-acetyl neuraminic acid or sialic acid, two different names. So this is the receptor for influenza virus. If you just take purified sialic acid, it will bind to the virus. But in cells, sialic acid is linked to proteins. Yes? So does that mean in theory, um, I guess, if you could withstand the intake of sialic acid, that if you were, I guess, had really early stages of influenza, just like flush your whole system with sialic acid and um, like get all the viruses? So you're saying, could we use sialic acid as an antiviral? So the answer is no, it doesn't have high enough affinity but the avidity of flu for sialic acid on the surface is enough to get the virus to stick on the particle. Uh, we have sialic acid analogs, which are inhibitors of neuraminidase, though, and that's Tamiflu and Relenza, and we will talk about those later. But sialic acid doesn't work as an inhibitor. Our mucous membranes are actually full of mucins with sialic acid, and these can be inhibitors of the virus, but the neuraminidase cleaves those off and allows the virus to pass through. Uh, so sialic acid is typically the last sugar on a chain of sugars, which is then linked to a protein. So here's a typical glycoprotein with sugars attached at two places. The sialic acid is the last one, and the virus clamps onto that. Now, the uh, influenza A viruses, which are the ones that cause most of the illness that you hear about, they, depending on what kind of virus, they have two different preferences for sialic acid. So it turns out that this linkage between sialic acid and the second sugar, which here is galactose, the nature of that chemical linkage uh, can determine how well binding occurs. So human strains, like an alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid. This is actually an alpha-2,3 linked. All that means is that the two sugars are linked through the alpha-2 and alpha-3 carbons, right? Human strains prefer alpha-2,6, which means this carbon is linked up to the sixth carbon up here. Avian strains like this conformation, right, alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids. So birds who are infected with uh, influenza viruses prefer to have uh, the receptor of alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids. And this is important because we don't have, in our upper tract, we don't have alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids, only in our lower tract. So people who get infected with H5N1 influenza virus, which unless you're living in a cave, you must have heard it's in the news lately. Uh, those viruses, when they infect humans, they have to get way down into the respiratory tract. And the fear is, of course, that they will evolve to recognize alpha-2,6 linked sialic acid. So we're going to talk a lot about that later on. Yes? Everywhere. Every tissue has sialic acid in it. But flu only replicates in your respiratory tract. So something else must control that, and we'll talk about that later. All right, uh, let's look a little bit in detail on how the hemagglutinin binds sialic acid. So we have the structure of the hemagglutinin solved by X-ray crystallography. It's linked to the viral membrane. Remember, I showed you this the other day. It's, it has a very, it has a fibrous stem and a globular head. And at the very top, in a pocket at the tip of this globular head, is the binding site for sialic acid. And this green molecule is sialic acid, its structure combined with the HA was solved by crystallography many years ago. And you can see all the interactions sialic acid makes with uh, the amino acids in the HA. And you can make very small amino acid changes in this HA and convert it from one that likes alpha-2,3 to 2,6 or vice versa. So you don't need a lot of amino acid changes to do that. So that's the receptor binding site. Now let's look at another envelope virus, HIV. <clears throat> much more, a little bit more complex interaction. HIV virion is shown here, and these are the viral glycoproteins. There are very few on the HIV virion. If you remember the, the EM of influenza virus that we looked at 
last time, the spikes are packed on the surface. The HA is, is very abundant and that the HA spikes are packed together. In contrast, the HAV virion has very sparse number, very low numbers of glycoproteins on its surface. Anyway, these attach to a CD4 receptor and a co-receptor on the cell surface. And we'll look at that interaction more a bit later. So those were two envelope viruses. How about adenoviruses, the one with the Sputnik-like projections? Well, it turns out that the very tip of these fibers that stick out from each five-fold axis, this is the receptor attachment protein. Its structure is known as well. And this is what attaches to the receptor in the cell. Okay, so that's a little bit about binding. Now let's move into how these viruses get into the cell and go to the right place in order to replicate. That site, wherever the genome goes, is different depending on the genome type. And remember, there are seven genome types, right? Or, or was that eight? Seven. seven. There you go. Lucky seven. And next time you'll be able to get all of them as well. Um, depending on the genome type, they have to get, go to different parts of the cell, as you will see next time. So how do viruses get into cells? They don't invent anything. They take advantage of what's already there. And cells have a lot of ways to take up material from the environment. One of them that you know well is phagocytosis. This is typically done to pick up large particles. So a macrophage will phagocytose a bacterium or smaller particles. And in general, we don't think of phagocytosis as a productive entryway for viruses, more like a destructive pathway. Uh, most, many viruses enter cells by endocytosis. This is the process by which cells take up small molecules from the extracellular environment. And what we're concerned about in, in studying viruses is receptor-mediated endocytosis, a process by which Specific ligands are bound to receptors, like cholesterol would be bound to a cholesterol receptor, and taken into the cell by this endocytic pathway. There are other ways that particles get in. Pinocytosis is one of them. It's a nonspecific way of bringing in particles, but viruses have been shown to use receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis. Now, the cytoplasm of the cell is really crowded. It's not easy to move around. Like we, we grow up being shown pictures of the cytoplasm, which have a ribosome here and a mitochondrion and a lot of empty space. But in fact, it is jam-packed. And if you could go through it, it would look like something like this. So this is an artist's rendering. This is the plasma membrane here. Uh, so these are plasma membrane proteins. And then as you move below, you have the, the, the filaments, the actin filaments just below the plasma membrane and many more other filamentous structures in the cell. These are ribosomes, these, these pink things here, a little uh, endoplasmic reticulum now. We're moving closer to the nucleus. And here's another, this was too long to put all that together. Here's the nuclear membrane. So the two, the two leaflets of the nuclear membrane. And finally, we're in the nucleus here with our nucleosome DNA. So it's really crowded. The cytoplasm is jam-packed. So things don't just diffuse through the cytoplasm. They have to be actively transported. Now, some viruses just enter the membrane and stay pretty close to it, but others have to get to the nucleus, and that requires transport pathways. And this is a nice thought experiment that was done to show this or to illustrate this to you. So this is the estimated rate of transport of three different viruses uh, by diffusion, either in water or in the cytoplasm, assuming that the cytoplasm has a certain viscosity. So polio, for example, in water, to travel 10 microns, which is about a cell's worth of traveling, um, the length of a typical human cell, 3.85 seconds. It's not bad in water. But if you now go in the cytoplasm, it takes you half an hour to get from the surface to the nucleus. It's a long time. I can tell you that in a polio-infected cell, by a half hour, there are lots of biosynthetic events happening. So it doesn't take that long to get an infection started. Herpes simplex, which is bigger, takes 15 seconds in water, two hours in the cytoplasm, and the pox viruses, which are even bigger, 35 seconds versus five hours. So clearly, viruses simply can't diffuse. They have to use transport. And this goes for everything viral, capsids, subcapsid assemblies, RNA, proteins, whatever. They all have to be transported. They don't just uh, diffuse. Now, we're going to be talking about a couple of these entry pathways today. They're all summarized on this nice slide. Uh, and here is a typical cell right here, and the nucleus is down here. Uh, 
We're going to talk about entry events that occur at the cell surface. So there's some viruses that fuse with the plasma membrane, and they put their nucleic acid into the cytoplasm, and that's where they begin to replicate. Other viruses have a, an envelope around an icosahedral nucleocapsid. They fuse at the surface, but then this capsid has DNA in it, so it has to get to the nucleus. And to do that, it has to travel along a microtubule. It uses the motors in the cell, the dynein motors that are used for transporting cellular components. The viruses latch on to the dynein, and they're transported down to the nucleus, so they can eventually dock on to the nuclear pore complex. Some viruses are taken up by endocytosis. There are many different kinds of endocytosis in cells. There's clathrin-dependent. Uh, there's clathrin and caviolin-independent. There's caviolin-dependent, but the major characteristic is that they all take up particles uh, by forming a vesicle, and then the vesicle has to move towards the nucleus, and that vesicle also uses the microtubules to move close to the nucleus. They don't just diffuse, okay? So remember that particles don't diffuse, they use active transport systems to get into the cell. So we're going to look at some of these specific pathways today. So first, a, a series of electron micrographs of, of the process of endocytosis. Um, this is basic biology, but this is the pathway that viruses usurp. Here is a cell surface, and these are uh, molecules attaching to receptors on the cell surface. And that attachment, so endocytosis is a constitutive process. The membrane is always turning over. And here you see that the membrane is invaginating. It's taking with it a number of these ligands, and it's forming a pit here. And you can see it's full of ligands. And eventually, this pinches off and becomes an intracellular vesicle. So viruses take advantage of this process. They bind to receptors, which are internalized by this endocytic pathway. So now you would have the virus in this vesicle instead of a ligand attached to its receptor. So here is a nice movie showing you transport of vesicles within the cytoplasm. So that's a microtubule, and there's a dynein motor walking along uh, the, the microtubule. So this is a vesicle. If it had a virus in it, uh, it would be being transported from the plasma membrane to the, to the cell interior. And virus particles would do the same thing. This could be a virus particle attached to a dynein motor. Yes? Now, so the, that picture that I showed you, these are not virus particles. These are, these are some extracellular molecules that are being taken up. They're quite large, so they may be a, uh, some sort of polymer or something. But they're not viruses. With, with virus uptake, the viruses are much bigger, so they would just be one per vesicle. All right, so let's look at uh, some viruses that enter at the cell surface first. So these are the enveloped viruses. Um, this one is a paramyxovirus, but it's, it happens for other viruses as well, HIV too. So these viruses bind to receptors, and then the virus membrane fuses with the cell membrane right at the cell surface. So the fusion reaction occurs, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail. And that basically opens up the interior of the particle so that the RNA can come out right into the cytoplasm. So we have what we call penetration and uncoding. Penetration means that the particle is in the cytoplasm and it's been released from the uh, virus, the virion particle. Uh, HIV does similar process as well, fuses at the cell membrane. Now, how does this happen? There are two general mechanisms illustrated here. The most important thing you need to know is that whenever fusion occurs, it has to be regulated. Viruses can't be fusing randomly with every piece of lipid that they hit into, right? Because I told you earlier, viruses in your fluids are randomly encountering all sorts of material, including cells that aren't the right cells for them, which means they don't have the right receptor. So if these viruses were fusing randomly, they would be fusing with these cells and never get into them. Yes? You can close that if you want, but I'll, I'll try. Um, so you have to control fusion. And these are two ways that fusion is regulated in, in viruses that fuse at the surface, all right? So the top one, you see we have two viral glycoproteins here, HN and F. HN, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, this is the attachment protein. It attaches to a cell receptor. The other is the fusion protein. 
So all of these viruses that fuse their membranes with that of the cell have a fusion protein. And the, the nature of this is it has a very hydrophobic end all the way over here, which is typically here. And this inserts into the membrane of the cell and catalyzes fusion. We'll look at the exact mechanism of that in a bit. So look what happens here. Initially, the fusion protein is folded towards the membrane of the virus. It's hidden. So, it, so if the virus bumps into anything, it's not going to fuse with it. All right? And then when this HN protein hits its cell receptor, which is the red protein, that causes a conformational change in the fusion protein. So now you see this fusion peptide, which was originally here, it's the little squiggly line, is now exposed and it can insert into the cell membrane. So the receptor of the virus, the receptor attachment protein of the virus binds the cell receptor and that exposes the fusion protein. Now, the fusion protein is typically not only buried, but it has to be released by cleavage. So here is the precursor of the fusion protein. And you can see the fusion protein, which is that squiggly line, is buried in the middle of the protein. Uh, this has to be cleaved by a protease which is typically a cell protease, to expose the end terminus of the fusion protein so that eventually it can go in the cell membrane. If this protein is not cleaved, when this rearrangement occurs, there will be no fusion protein and there will be no fusion. Yes? So the protease is a cell protease. And that is one of the determinants of which cells the virus will grow in. It's one of the reasons why flu is limited to your lungs because that protease is only present in our lungs. All right. Other proteases are ubiquitous and therefore the virus replicates in many different cell types, but it's always a cell protease that does this. Yes? So So they use many cell proteins, among them proteases, to do some of the replication cycle. But the viruses also carry in some of their own proteins. And some of them are proteases, but they don't cleave these fusion proteins. All right, so it's a mixture. And it depends on how big the virus genome is. If we're talking about a small virus genome with not much coding capacity, then that virus takes more from the host than a huge genome that can encode many proteins. All right, so the extent of dependence on the host varies from small to large genomes. But, we, but viruses always need things from the host that it can't supply. Okay? Does that answer your question? No? What didn't I answer? Tell me. Does the cell have a protease on the plasma membrane? Proteins, okay. Got it. Well, this is this is a, this receptor is a membrane protein on the host cell, right? So they, they, they have their own function to maintain the normal function of the host cell. Function. Right. So the, 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 the bacteria, the, the virus, this virus course. Absolutely, yes. Uh, this receptor, for example, is a cell protein that has a function in the cell. The virus has evolved to utilize it. It's not there for the virus. It is a normal cell protein. Every cell protein that all viruses use is a cell protein with a normal function that viruses have evolved to take advantage of. That's something you can assume for everything that we talk about. Okay. The only exceptions are uh, immune proteins in the cell or in the host whose function is to clear the virus infection. All right, so that's one mechanism. So the receptor binding exposes the fusion peptide. Now, the other one is shown here. I'm showing you this. This is HIV, and this is a, a very different way of doing it, and it, many of the things we're going to talk about later depend on understanding this. So the, the receptor attachment protein for HIV is shown here. So this is the viral membrane. It's composed of two subunits called TM and SU. They are non-covalently linked. The TM has the fusion peptide at the end, and it's buried. When this, the receptor for HIV is CD4 on T lymphocytes. So that's shown right here in green. When SU binds CD4, it induces a conformational change in SU, 
So that SU in turn can bind the second receptor, which is a chemokine receptor. And two different kinds of chemokine receptors. We just abbreviate them as CCR. All right, so now you see the uh, SU is binding with both CD4 and the chemokine receptor. That second interaction is then needed to, to bump the fusion peptide into the right position so it can fuse with the cell. So it's just another way of regulating fusion. Here we did it with one um, attachment protein. Here we do it with a, a single attachment protein that hits two different receptors. But the end result is the same. You expose a fusion peptide, and we've accomplished the goal of hiding the fusion peptide in the process. Okay. So here is a movie of the fusion process of uh, HIV with its cell. There are many artistic liberties taken in this movie, but it, it illustrates some of the things that are hard to put on a, a two-dimensional sheet of paper. So the red are virions of HIV. This is a T lymphocyte that's about to be infected. And we're going to zoom in in a moment uh, and see the receptors. So here on the lymphocyte surface are the two different receptors. We have CD4 is this blue one, and the chemokine receptor is the yellow one. So we have to be a little dramatic here. We have to see the, the virus looming in the background. So here are the viral glycoproteins. Um, it, this, <laughs> yeah, it, it glows, right? Uh, so the fusion protein is up here by the viral membrane. It's a little sharp point. And um, the, that's, that's the fusion protein right there. And this is the part that binds uh, SU, that binds CD4 initially. It's got to swing around a little, too. And then eventually it binds the chemokine receptor. So that you know what's going on there based on what I've told you. Of course, this is an artist's rendition. Now they get rid of the uh, SU because they, the artist didn't know what to do with it. And the fusion protein folds out towards the membrane, and it goes into the cell membrane and catalyzes fusion. Now, an important part of the fusion reaction is what's called hairpinning of the fusion protein. You can see it's bending. And what it does is it pulls the virus and the cell membrane very close. And one of the things you have to do to, to fuse two membranes is get them really close so you get rid of all the water molecules in between them, and then fusion can occur. So what happens there, the fusion event occurred, and the viral nucleocapsid uh, goes into the cytoplasm. But here it all came apart, which isn't right. It's supposed to stay together in one complex. All right? But otherwise, not too bad. OK, now let's talk about uh, influenza viruses. This is another one of our model viruses that we're going to be looking at throughout this course. Remember, the influenza particle binds sialic acid containing receptors via the HA protein at the cell surface. This particle is then taken up by the endocytic pathway. You can see here uh, the virus is moving towards the nucleus in an endosome. Now, influenza is a little bit unusual for an RNA virus in that it replicates in the nucleus. So its RNAs have to get to the nucleus. So it uses the endocytic pathway to do that. So what happens here, as endosomes move in from the surface, you probably know, they become acidified. There are pumps, proton pumps, in the endosome membrane that pump protons into the interior and they lower the pH. So it goes from neutral to 6 and then 5-ish. And that, those protons, uh, as they're pumped in the middle, and the, middle get, the endosome gets acidified, the HA undergoes a conformational change. And guess what that conformational change does? It exposes a fusion peptide. So here in the, in the, uh, here's a blow-up of what's happening. The hemagglutinin is active as a trimer, three molecules. That globular head is bound to sialic acid on the cell membrane. Virus cell membrane, three sialic acid interactions. So that's the minimum number of interactions you need to get infection. You probably need more than that. As the uh, interior of the endosome acidifies, the sialic acid binding heads splay away from the membrane, exposing, and the fusion peptide is able to insert. Now, normally, the fusion peptide, it's this red squiggly sequence. It's down by the virus membrane. It's hidden. Remember, you always have to hide that fusion protein in some way. And influenza exposes it at low pH. So this molecule, this HA, completely rearranges at low pH to insert the fusion uh, peptide into the host cell. This is, of course, the endosome membrane here. 
So look at all the things that happen at low pH. The heads come away, and this, this uh, hemagglutinin becomes a long molecule. You can see it, these alpha helixes, which are the purple colors, they're bent in half here. But at low pH, they extend. And that extension puts the fusion peptide into the endosome membrane. And then this whole const construct hairpins, just like the uh, HIV glycoprotein hairpin, and it draws the two membranes together so that they can fuse. Yes? If the cells, if, if the um, heads uh, attach when the pH is reduced, then wouldn't that mean the virus would just blow away? Well, by this, it, the, it's actually not clear if they are detaching from the receptor. But remember, this is in the cell already. It's here. So the virus isn't going anywhere. Uh, there's already insertion of the fusion peptide, which is holding the molecule on the surface. So I think this uh, structurally, it's thought that the heads move away it's to some extent, but it's not clear if they remain engaged or not. Yes? Uh, so the general thought is for vir RNA viruses, it's the RNA that is sensed. So right now, no, because there isn't any RNA in the cytoplasm. But there are also protein sensors. They haven't really been studied for flu. For other viruses, it's clear that there are protein sensors that could work earlier. But at this point, no, you're totally unaware that anything is happening. All right, so these fusion peptides, the hairpin, they bring the, the membranes together, and you get a fusion, and that releases the genome into the cytoplasm, and eventually you can get into the nucleus. Yeah? Is there like a time element? Because what if it's fused early and then it's dumped its genetic material, like not close enough to the nucleus? Right. Well, that's why the fusion is regulated by pH here, so that early on these endosomes are neutral. And so there's no fusion and no release of the genetic material. It's only when the endosome is at a certain point in the cell, the pH is like five and a half, then it will fuse. So yes, it has to be regulated. And it's, in this case, it's pH regulated. So it's not going to happen exterior of the cell. Although if you took influenza virions and treat them with low pH, they will undergo this conformational change, but nothing will happen because there's no, no membrane opposed to them, right? Yes? So the pumps that are moving the proton into the endosome, are they from the virus or the, or the cell? So, the, so these are cellular pumps. These are proton pumps that are present. Their normal function is to acidify the endosome. So this process, remember, takes ligands up from the extracellular fluids. And those ligands are attached to receptors. You acidify the endosome to release the ligands so that they can then be put out into the cytoplasm for use. So that's a normal cellular protein. There is a viral pump. Uh, involved here. We're, we'll talk about this a bit later today. There's, remember, the M2 protein in the virion is a different kind of pump, but it's also a proton pump. And that plays a role in getting these um, uh, RNAs out of the virion. All right, so this is the series of events that happen with the hemagglutinin in a flu. Just to show you, three different structures have been solved. Uh, here is the precursor without cleavage. So this is another glycoprotein that needs to be cleaved by a cellular protease in order for the fusion protein or the fusion peptide to be exposed. The fusion peptide is normally down at the bottom of this HA near the viral membrane. This is the uncleaved precursor. The cleaved precursor is shown here. Now we have a new C and an N terminus and the N terminus down here is the fusion peptide. So now it's exposed and finally the low pH form shown here. The fusion peptide is now all the way at the top where it can stick into the membrane. All right, the, the globular head was not present in this structure. So that's why I said before, we're not quite sure where it goes uh, during this entry process. So cleavage is necessary. If you don't cleave and you lower the pH, uh, this won't happen because you can't rearrange with these polypeptides linked together. Now, another view of this, just to show you this hair pinning, is shown here. This is HA uh, on the virus surface at low pH. It's extended with the fusion peptides into the endosome membrane. Uh, 
And this is an illustration of the hair pinning. So there's basically a fold occurring in the protein to draw the two membranes together. And the idea of this model, there is at least two uh, HA molecules that help make a bubble or pore in the, in the endosome membrane. And when they get close enough together, you exclude the water, these two membranes will fuse to get this kind of configuration. So that's what I mean by hair pinning. And this is a feature of all these uh, fusion proteins. Now, among all the different viruses, we can simplify their fusion proteins. There are three general types. Uh, class I are, are similar to the HA that we've just talked about. They are perpendicular to the membrane. The, the head is, is, is uh, at the top, and the fusion protein is at the bottom. They're mostly alpha helical, so the stem of that HA is mostly alpha helical, and they make trimers. So the trimer is the active form. And influenza was our model virus. But there are many other viruses that have the same kind of type 1 fusion protein. Uh, influenza virus is shown here. So here's the fusion active trimer without the head. Here's the fusion protein up here. If you look down on the top, that's what it looks like. Three proteins. Uh, a paramyxovirus related to measles, same thing. Ebola virus, same type 1 fusion protein. HIV and a different retrovirus. All very strikingly similar similar mechanisms of fusion, trimers, uh, alpha helical in content, and perpendicular to the membrane. So this is obviously something that works because it's, it's been conserved in many kinds of diff different kinds of viruses. Class II fusion proteins we saw last time, these are parallel to the membrane. They're mostly beta sheet. They form dimers. And an example that we use are the Flavy viruses, like the yellow fever virus, or dengue. There's a third class, which I tell you just to be complete, which is a combination of class one and two. These are perpendicular to the membrane, but they are a mixture of alpha helices and beta sheets, and they also make trimers. The rhabdoviruses, uh, rabies virus, for example, and the herpes virus glycoproteins are part of this class. So just to remind you, this is the influenza HA trimer. It is a class one, mostly alpha helical, perpendicular to the membrane. And this is the Flavy virus dimer. This is, again, the glycoprotein of the virus that attaches to the cell receptor. It's kind of unusual because it's parallel to the membrane. Uh, and it is uh, a dimer. And this is how these dimers of these parallel type 2 proteins look on the virion surface here. So this is a reconstruction, a cryo-EM reconstruction of dengue virus, another Flavy virus, a very important Flavy virus in terms of disease, human disease. And these are these type 2 fusion proteins uh, that are arrayed on the surface. Now, these bind to their receptors in this conformation, but when they undergo fusion, low pH triggered fusion, uh, they actually raise up because the fusion proteins are buried down here. That's how these viruses protect them. At low pH, the molecules raise up. And I think we have some diagrams of that. So these are two kinds of type 2 fusion proteins that are roughly parallel to the membrane. Let's start with the Flavy virus one down here. That's the one I just showed you in the reconstructions. So it's a dimer. The fusion peptide is here. It's close to the membrane. It's hidden. At low pH, uh, these cylinders come up and, and insert into the membrane. The alpha virus is similar. These are also type 2 proteins. Here there is actually a second protein uh, that is protecting the fusion peptide. And at low pH, that second protein moves away, and then the uh, peptides, the fusion peptides, which are up here, insert into the membrane. So really, it's all the same mechanism of low pH-mediated fusion. And you have to, if you just remember that you have to hide the fusion protein, that will, that will help you a lot. Yes? Um, along, going along with the fact that low pH change, changes their composition, I'm guessing then, like, viruses that would infect your stomach and that would have contact with stomach acid have to some point, like, would be modified or else they would conform to the way. Yeah, so these viruses can't go into your stomach. They will never infect influenza, dengue. So influenza is a respiratory pathogen, so it can't go into the stomach. Dengue is transmitted by mosquitoes that bite you. So right, these would not do well in the stomach. They would, they would start fusing and hit your, stom your stomach cells and never be productive, right? So so a lot of those are icosahedral shells, which are very stable, or can be stable to low pH. There are a few enveloped viruses that go through the gut, but they don't, they don't depend on these kinds of fusion proteins. So evolution has taken care of all that. Yeah. Yes? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Three. Yeah. This this is wrong. It's a dimer. So you can see you got to believe the structure. Structure is a dimer. The other was an artist's rendition, but they're dimers. Type two uh, fusion proteins are dimers. Well, I. Just, it's my textbook, so I, this was a long time ago. <laughs> I could have corrected the art. But in fact, this was now f over five years ago, and um, it wasn't clear at the time, but now it is. So in the next edition, we will fix this. Yeah. I debated whether I should put this in, but it's a dimer. It's not a trimer. But the mechanism is important. OK, fusion is, again, regulated. We've talked about this. You don't want it to occur in the wrong place. Um, so for class ones, the hemagglutinin uh, the fusion, the cleavage activates fusion. The, the situation is not as clear cut for type 2. Sometimes the cleavage of a second protein activates fusion. Sometimes it's the actual fusion protein itself. But in all cases, the goal is to regulate it and regulate it in, in part by low pH, trigger it by low pH. So let's return to the influenza. I want to complete this entry series. We got to fusion of the virus and endosome membrane. And now you see all these little, uh, R these are RNAs, by the way, which are floating out of the particle. And they're being imported into the nucleus, because that's where they have to go in order to replicate. Now, this is where the importance of the virus proton pump comes into play. Remember, I told you that there's a pump in the endosome membrane that pumps protons into the endosome. And that allows fusion to occur. While this is happening, the virus pump, there's an M2 protein in the virion itself. That is taking those protons and putting them into the virion interior. Okay, So we have protons in the endosome. Those get pumped into the virion interior. That is thought to be needed in order for these RNAs to dissociate when the fusion event occurs. Okay, So this event here, all these green RNAs coming out, this would not occur if you didn't acidify the virion interior. Okay. And the acidification is thought to disrupt interactions be between the RNAs and structural proteins that hold them together. Now, the reason we know this is because we have a drug, an antiviral called amantadine, that blocks the viral proton channel. It's, a, it's actually a drug that's used to treat people. And this prevents acidification, and therefore it stops infection at this point. The RNAs can't get away from the capsid, and they never get into the nucleus. Okay. So here's a little movie of uh, influenza virus entry. Um, <clears throat> so this is the capsid here, which they're calling a capsid, but there's no capsid in influenza virus, really, because it's a nucleocapsid of RNAs. But um, this, uh, this is the virion. Here are your glycoproteins on the surface. The RNA is in the interior. So that's a virus. This is an epithelial cell surface. So it's floating around randomly. It's going to attach to a sialic acid containing receptor right there. It gets taken up by endocytosis. These are clathrin-dependent endocytosis. So those are clathrin cages surrounding the endosome. It then moves into the cell. What's missing here, of course, are the microtubules that are moving the endosome in. Oh, there it is. Put it in later. It's walking really quickly. <laughs> the clathrin comes off. This is, a tip. this is the normal endocytic pathway the clathrin dissociates. And then uh, the fusion event occurs. And all these are those ribonucleoproteins, the flu RNAs, that are then going to get into the nucleus. These are the nuclear pores. They get actively transported in. Okay, So that's just what I've told you in a movie form. There are a couple of things wrong with this. If you watch the movie on your own, you'll, you'll see them right there. Do you see those triangles that were forming as the capsid came together? That's not right. First of all, that's not a capsid, of course. This is just a shell of protein uh, beneath the viral membrane. If you look back at the, actually, I have one here, the diagrams of influenza virus. There's a membrane. Then there's an M protein, those little blue spheres that just makes a shell under it. But it's not a capsid. So here they're calling it a capsid. That's wrong. Uh, and inside is the nucleocapsid, which is the RNA. So they're under the impression that this is an icosahedral shell, right? Because they're making, they're taking it apart in little triangles, which is how icosahedra are made. And that's just not correct. But what they did get right is that the RNAs come out at the end of endocytosis because the interior of the virion was acidified, and those RNAs then get into the nucleus.
All right, so a couple of other viruses we'll go through just to illustrate some different approaches to entry. Uh, these are uh, alpha viruses, which are somewhat related to flavies. They have enough differences, but they're, they have an unusual way of getting into cells. These are enveloped viruses. They have icosahedral capsids under the envelope. They're taken up by endocytosis. Uh, they fuse, the membrane of the virus fuses with that of the endosome as, at low pH, but then the capsid remains stuck onto what was left of the virus membrane here. And what happens next is that ribosomes begin to bind the capsid and take it apart. So these are ribosomes here coming in. They're disassembling the capsid and then latching on to the viral RNA, which is in the capsid. So this, you can predict what polarity of RNA is this if the first step is binding of ribosomes. So what do you think? Plus. It's translated first. It's a plus strand RNA. So the ribosomes dissociate the capsid. And in fact, throughout the early stages of infection, the, the genome remains associated with what used to be an endosome, and it's, the RNA is translated extensively there. So this is a unique way to dissociate the capsid. All right, pH doesn't do it all, so the ribosomes take apart that icosahedral shell. Yes? Right. That's why I'm showing this to you, because it's really unusual. Ribosomes are involved in the disassembly of these capsids. And these obviously are cellular. They're cellular ribosomes, right? So, um, are they disassembling it um, because there's some sort of tag that this is foreign substance and they're recognizing mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the signal for disassembly? So the, it's not known. The idea is that there's a little bit of the viral RNA sticking out and that's a signal for ribosome attachment. I mean, they're not going to the capsid and binding. They're just floating around, hitting it, and then one randomly hits it and starts to disassemble it. It's a very unusual process, all right? So the idea is that a little bit of the RNA is sticking out, and that's what the, the ribosomes latch onto. And then as they translate and pull it out, the capsid starts to come apart. So you can actually dis but you can actually show interaction of ribosomes with the capsid proteins. So they're also binding to the capsid. How it actually disassembles, we don't really know. But yeah, it's, it's unusual. That's why I wanted to show it to you. All right, here's a movie of dengue, which is related to the entry that uh, I've just shown you. It gets in by endocytosis. Now, this is a type test, type 2 glycoprotein. So they're initially flat on the surface of the virion, right? And now as it acidifies, they are going to stick up. Now, the problem here is that it's, the virion is in the interior of the endosome. It's not bound to the membrane. It should be bound, okay? Yeah, but now you see it's showing it binding, which is not correct. It should be already bound in this conformation. And then as the pH drops, uh, the, the, well, the, these things are already in an extended conformation, and they should be bound to the, uh, to the endosome. Now they're hairpinning, they're turning and moving. You can see a bit of the endosome membrane pulled down to the virus membrane. So that's the hairpinning step. But the, the virion should be bound. It could be bound in the back, but they show this part where the um, virions are coming in. Now, um, this is the RNA spilling out of the capsid. Um, I think those yellow bits are ribosomes, and those, those are what are dissociating the capsid in the mechanism that I told you. So let's look at that again. Endocytosis. So I don't think it's bound. I think it's just floating around in there. It should be bound. So if any of you become illustrators one day, please you know, remember this. So this should be bound as the conformation changes. And as you said, it could be bound in the back. But then they zoom in, and they show one of these proteins not bound. This should already be bound to the membrane. So the, after the low pH occurs, that's not when binding occurs. Anyway, then they do the hairpinning, which is pretty good. Uh, to show you how the two membranes are brought together. They make it a little insectoid, which I think is not necessary here with the, you know, the moving legs. All right, then you have a fusion event. And then you know, the, the depiction of the capsid isn't perfect. There should be an exposed capsid on the surface. But what they're showing here is the RNA is spilling out right away, bound to ribosomes. So that's not actually correct. What I told you is that the capsid ends up on the surface and then um, the ribosomes dissociated, but 
it gives you a lot of insight that I can't do in a two-dimensional picture. Uh, two more, I think two more viruses to look at. One of them is adenovirus. And this is unusual, again, because of the way it gets out of the endosome. Adenovirus, the Sputnik-like virus, uh, it needs two different receptors to get in. We'll talk about that. It's taken up by endocytosis. As the pH of the endosome drops, the virus particle starts to come apart. Not completely, but a few proteins come out of the particle, and one of those proteins lyses the endosome. So that one of these, um, I think it's this triangular protein right here. It's normally hidden in the particle when the low pH, when the pH drops in the endosome. This, part, this protein comes out of the particle and pokes holes in the endosome. It ruptures the endosome. And so this partially disassembled particle then gets out. It hooks up with a microtubule, gets transported to the nucleus, and it docks onto a nuclear pore. Okay. So it's another way to get out of an endosome. Low pH dependent, but now this virus has this protein, a lysin, basically, that gets it out. So here are some nice electron micrographs. Here's a microtubule, and there is one of these partially disassembled viruses riding along on it. And then here are a couple of virions docked onto nuclear pore complexes. Adenovirus. Poliovirus is another icosahedral virus. I debated including this this year, but I can't resist. You know, it's the virus I've worked on all my life. This virus is taken up by endocytosis, but it doesn't need low pH to get its genome out. This virus actually uncoats very near the plasma membrane. You can see these vesicles form, and then the RNA is, is uncoating right up here. We think that the trigger for this uncoating is actually the virus receptor. So what you see the virus binding to the receptor up here is changing the conformation of the particle. And then we think this makes a pore in the particle that allows the RNA to come out. So here is a higher magnification of what we believe is going on. Here is uh, two receptors interacting with the virus. So this is a very close-up view of the five-fold axis. Here is, if you remember from last time, there is a molecule of sphingosine in the capsid just below the receptor binding site. When the receptor binds, that sphingosine is ejected. Remember, if we add a drug that substitutes for the sphingosine, an antiviral drug, it locks the virus in this conformation and it can't uncoat. The sphingosine goes out. That allows the viral proteins to move around, and a pore can open up at the five-fold axis. And that pore is formed by uh, hydrophobic residues of VP1. That's the blue protein. These are normally hidden in the interior. They snake out. They make a pore in the membrane. And this is the RNA coming out. So we think this is all catalyzed by the virus receptor, because you can actually take virus particles and receptor, and you mix them, and the RNA comes out in solution without even having cells around. So another solution to getting RNA out of the capsid, this one does not depend on low pH. So this just depends on the receptor. So if you have soluble polio receptor floating around, that would trigger release of the RNA. Fortunately for the virus, I guess, there isn't much of that soluble protein in us. This is a closer view of these events. So the virus receptor binds in that little groove uh, around the five-fold axis. We talked about that before. There's a small pocket at the base of the receptor binding site. It's normally occupied by this lipid. When the receptor binds, the lipid gets removed, and that allows the pore to form. And the, the antiviral drug fits into that pocket very tightly. And when the receptor docks into there, the drug stays. So the pore can't form in the virion. The virus RNA can get out. That stops the infection. OK, so this is another drug that blocks uncoding. The other one was the amantadines that block influenza uncoding. Yes? That's right. Mm. So you're wondering about possible side effects of this drug by interacting with some cellular target? Well, it's, it's, the, the viral pathway to extract the genome. Right. 
Well, the drug was selected to fit precisely in this pocket. And as far as we know, there are no cellular targets of this drug. So in theory, you, you, if you were targeting a general enzyme or some other protein in the cell that the virus needed, that would be a concern. But there doesn't seem to be anything. This is the virus particle right here. And the virus, in the, so the drug doesn't hit the receptor, it hits the virus, okay? So this, I think we looked at the other day, this is the virus particle with the drug bound. The drug is the little yellow molecules here. And based on icosahedral symmetry, you would predict there are five around each five-fold axis, five copies of the drug times 12 uh, five-fold axes would give you 60. And in fact, that's how many drug molecules are bound. Now, some viruses need two receptors to get into cells. And remember, we told you earlier that Coxsackie and adenovirus share a receptor. It turns out that uh, Coxsackie viruses also need a second receptor, both this molecule called DAF and a second one called CAR, which is shared by adenoviruses. Now, Coxsackie viruses initiate infection at epithelial surfaces, respiratory tract, or gastrointestinal tract. But interestingly, CAR is not up here on the apical surface. It's a, it's a tight junction protein. It's in between the cells. It is not accessible to virus binding. So how does the virus get to it? That's why the virus needs a second receptor, and that's shown here. So on these epithelial cells where the CAR receptor is buried in the interface between cells, it's not accessible, the virus, Coxsackie virus B, initially binds a different receptor, uh, the um, DAF protein, DAF. That binding initiates a series of signaling events, phosphorylations that loosen up the cytoskeleton and open up the gaps between cells, okay? So this must be a normal pathway that during development that occurs to loosen up junctions. The virus taps into it, it loosens up these junctions, and then it moves over there and it can bind CAR and get into the cell. All right, that's why it needs two receptors because the one it needs to be taken up into the cell, this CAR receptor is not accessible. So it binds the first one to trigger a series of events that open up the junction and let the virus get to it. Yes, sorry? Coxsackie virus B, the one identified upstate New York, All right? Yes? Okay, so that is an illustration of a different issue which shows that antibodies can't fit into the pocket that, that receptors fit into. It's totally unrelated to the topic here. Right. Okay, two receptors. Um, one more virus entry pathway is Rio, and this is a virus with double-stranded RNAs. Remember, it has two icosahedral shells, concentric, one inside the other. And what I want to show you here is that this virus is taken up by endocytosis. And not only during endocytosis does the endosome acidify, but these endosomes fuse with lysosomes, which deliver proteolytic enzymes to the endosome. These enzymes are actually used by the virus to strip off the outer shell. And you end up with just the inner shell particle. So the virus has evolved to use cellular enzymes. Most, most viruses get out of the endosome before the lysosomes fuse because they don't want to be digested away. But Rio virus stays in there and it actually uses the enzymes to get degraded to a core. And this is actually the substrate for RNA synthesis that we'll see next time. Yes? Yeah, sure. That's how all of this stuff emerged. It's just random. It worked, and then you select for the events that, that are productive. Exactly. Yes. Sorry? Rio virus. Rio virus, double shell, double stranded RNA. R E O V I R U S. Rio. This stands for respiratory enteric orphan virus. Rio. So rhino would be similar to polio, which I showed you with the little, with the little sphingosine molecule underneath the receptor binding site. Noro, we, we actually don't know how that would work. Different virus uh, family. 
I believe the noros require acidification, but you know the exact mechanisms haven't been worked out yet. It's a good question because they go through the gut, right? It must be hidden in some way. Maybe it requires a second protein to be acid triggerable. We don't know. Did you have a question? Yeah. Right, like, right. Why would that get selected for? Because that seems such like much more difficult than just having one receptor to get into a cell. To you and I, it's difficult. But to a virus that makes billions of particles and one of those can do it, they get selected for. So, um, I mean, it could be that this, this receptor was in a different place on a different cell and the virus evolved to use it, but then it, it got moved. But the thing is, in a population of particles that are made from any cell, there are particles that can do almost anything. And maybe bind a different receptor and do this. Sometimes it's hard to see the path of evolution to get to this, but that's what happened. Yeah. So our view of simplicity is you have to throw it out the door because it doesn't always apply. All right, so that summarizes all the entry stages. And what I want to just do in one more slide is tell you the final step. Some of these viruses have to get into the nucleus. They have DNA in them. And there are a couple of ways to do that. For influenza viruses, they don't have DNA, of course, but they have to get into the nucleus anyway. These are very unusual that the RNA goes in. Those RNAs complex to protein. They are small enough to go through the nuclear pore, so they just get imported. Some viruses dock onto the nuclear pore, and they have a portal. The, R the DNA goes through the portal. Remember herpes? I showed you that capsid with a portal on one side. That's where the DNA comes out. Adenoviruses get partially disassembled on the nuclear pore, and the DNA goes through the pore, so most of the proteins stay outside. And finally, the smallest DNA-containing viruses, the parvoviruses, the ones that can infect your pets and even you, they are small enough to fit through the pore. All right? So flu and all of our DNA viruses, with the exception of vaccinia, have to get into the, nuclear into the nucleus to replicate, and that's how they do it.